Hi, welcome to the yet another episode of Curiosity, episode number 12. So what did I learn in the week number 32 of 2020? As usual, Curiosity covers topics across the disciplines including honeybee venom for cancer, religious violence, PhD student success, women in politics, incentivization of passions, paracetamol in psychiatry, masks, class difference in empathy, lizards, COVID-19 and so on. Plus, of course, as usual, news, observances and opportunities. So please stay tuned. Our first story of the week is about COVID-19. So the paper is published in Lancet E-Clinical Medicine by a US team with uh, 662 cohorts. The title of the paper is Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome in Children, a Systematic Review. So this paper is all about what COVID-19 asymptomatic infection does on the heart of the children. Post-COVID-19 syndrome severely damages children's hearts. Immense inflammation on the cardiac blood vessel, that is what the paper says. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in the children, that is MISC, believed to be linked to the COVID-19, damages the heart to such an extent that some children will need lifelong monitoring and interventions. So the situation is really sad and disappointing and serious friends. COVID-19 patients will most likely suffer from highly increased incidence in ischemic strokes, heart attacks, kidney, liver, pancreas damage and so on. This has already been known. And long-term health costs to society from this virus, well, we have no clue. Well, perhaps you know that the building collapse of 9-11 didn't kill much people. You know, the later death due to the consequence of 9-11, for example, the debris in the air, you know, the breathing of the debris caused a lot more death. Many times that of the death caused by the building collapse alone. Even now, the people are dying from it. Just like that 9-11 incident, COVID-19, the consequences would be really vast and expansive. And related article published in Scientific American is all about COVID-19 can wreck your heart. Even if you haven't had any symptoms, I linked up in the description section of this video. By the way, Scientific American is a very famous popular science magazine and all these articles are highly accessible to everyone who can read and understand English. Our second story of the week is also about COVID-19. This is a paper published in Physics of Fluids Journal by a US team. The title of the paper is Visualizing Droplet Dispersal for Face Shields and Masks with Exhalation Wall. This topic has been covered earlier also in my channel that uh, you know the mask with exhalation walls should not be used because it does not prevent the community transmission of COVID-19. And this paper just confirmed or substantiated that initial suspicion. Face shields and masks with exhalation walls are not effective at preventing COVID-19 transmission, finds a new droplet dispersal study. A quote from the paper, our observations suggest that to minimize the community spread of COVID-19, it may be preferable to use high-quality cloth or surgical masks that are of plain design instead of face shield and mask equipped with exhalation walls. So how are masks with walls covered with the filters, you know, with the exhalation wall, but it has got a filter <laughs> that is a plain nonsense. The reason people are putting the exhalation wall is to let out, you know, the air unhindered. And if you are still covering that with the, uh, the, the filter, then what is the, the point of having the wall? We can simply remove that wall completely, right? So there is no point in it. It's complete nonsense, you know. So instead of that, simply go for a normal mask. Uh, the, the fabric mask or even surgical mask if you cannot have a the, you know the fabric mask an additional problem with disposable mask is uh, the environmental impact you know these are disposable use and throw much better and same choice would be fabric masks the topic has been covered extensively in this channel including how to wash the fabric mask in proper scientific way by the way, this paper contains some very interesting laser image as well. These are something called near field view droplets illuminated by the horizontal laser sheet. So the authors, the you know, they, they studied in a horizontal laser sheet and they illuminated while other person is sneezing or coughing. And then they photographed with very high speed camera, you know. Now you can see that this is the, the person wearing, uh, you know, mask with uh, wall, exhalation wall, as you can see that it's not at all effective. While this is that fabric mask without any exhalation wall, now you can see that it's much more effective in preventing the transmission of the droplets. Our third story of the week is something to do with honeybees. 
Perhaps you know that the world's population of the honeybee is on decline because of non-judicious use of the pesticides. By the way, have you ever got stung by the honeybee? I have been stung by honeybee when I was in school. Friends, it was so painful and my hands got swollen. And what is the good news about the venom of this honeybee? This can be used for cancer therapy as per the latest paper published in Nature Precision Oncology. The title of the paper is Honeybee Venom and Militin Suppress a Growth Factor Receptor Activation in HER2 Enriched and Triple Negative Breast Cancer. The paper is by a team from Australia and US and well mind that this paper is a cell line study, uh, no clinical trials yet. The study found that the venom from honeybees that is militin has been found to rapidly kill aggressive and hard to treat breast cancer cells. That is basically aggressive carcinoma cells that has started spreading to other organs. The study also found that the venom's main component was combined with existing chemotherapy drugs. It was extremely efficient at reducing the tumor growth in mice. Researchers say that the discovery is exciting but there is a long way to go. Well, I'm very much thrilled that we have now another reason to save the honeybees, uh, which is a keystone species because you know honeybees are uh, uh, master pollinators and if we lose the honeybees, then the entire pollination uh, repertoire will be completely hampered, uh, which will have huge ramifications across the plant and animal kingdom, you know. So it is of course the keystone species and hearing their other use include the breast cancer treating, you know. So fighting the cancer is of course this is like a sweet icing on the cake. Of course, all around the world there are movements to save the honeybee. Perhaps the most famous uh, among them is in Germany, the Retter D. Bienen. That is, saving the bees movement in Bavaria in Germany. We need Retter D. Bienen in everywhere, friends. Honeybee venom for breast cancer is indeed a curiosity-driven application. Our fourth story of the week is from Psychology. The paper published in the journal Social Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience by the US team was entitled Effects of Acetaminophen on Risk Taking and the study included uh, 545 cohorts. By the way, the name Acetaminophen is an American version of the drug named Paracetamol that is what in here in India we call it. Common antipyretic and anti-inflammation drug that we usually use when we have a fever. Well, a single dose of Paracetamol that is around 1000 milligram uh, may make users more willing to take risk. That is what this new study has found. So compared to those who took placebo, Acetaminophen users took more risk in a game where they could win or lose rewards. They also rated activities like bungee jumping as less risky. Well, we already know that the paracetamol makes people less empathetic and maybe also that it increases the risk taking and decreases the inhibition. Well, it's always exciting to find new uses for the, the existing old drugs, you know, just like sildenafil uh, that is actually for the, uh, you know, the blood pressure and the heart ailment med medication. Now sildenafil is Viagra, you know, it is basically for, it's, 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 a, it's a aphrodisiac. It's just like exaptation in evolutionary biology. Finding new uses for the existing traits, for example, feather in the wings of the bird. Earlier studies have found that the paracetamol may even work during the heartbreak. That means to mend the broken heart. But mind that don't self-medicate. The NHS guideline clearly say do not take paracetamol for the painful emotions. We need more studies to substantiate these uses. And more importantly, we need systematic reviews like Cochrane reviews, you know, that look at the quality of evidence and come up with a standard guidelines. Our fifth story of the week is a paper published in the journal PLOS One by Australian team. The title of the paper is Do Successful PhD Outcomes Reflect the Research Environment Rather Than the Academic Ability? So this study shows that the research environment at the university, for example, the supervisor experience are more important for the outcomes, that is publications or citations of the student's PhD rather than the academic ability of the student alone. So the student's previous academic outcomes and research training was unrelated to the outcomes. So the most important factor is supervisor experience. So how good the student is with the supervisor and how good the supervisor is. The findings suggest that experienced supervisors researching in a priority research area facilitate the PhD student's productivity. So if you are a prospective PhD candidate, it matters with whom you are working rather than where you are 
doing your PhD. Even if you are in an Ivy League university, if the your PhD supervisor is not efficient, then you won't be getting very good productivity during your PhD time. A quote from the paper, given that citations, publication numbers and publications in higher ranked journals drive university rankings and that publications from the PhD student contribute approximately one third of all research outputs from the universities, strengthening the research infrastructure and supervision teams may be more important considerations for maximizing the contribution of PhD students to a university's international standing. So the paper is really significant for university administrators and policy makers as well. Yet another quote from the paper is that furthermore students who received a scholarship to support their studies generated significantly more publications in higher impact journals. Their work was cited more often and they were less likely to withdraw from their PhD. So incentivization through scholarship funding has positive impact. And guess what? Our next story of the week, the sixth story is also about incentivization of the passions. This paper has been published in the journal The Review of Economics and Statistics by a US team, which is indeed a meta-analysis of 100 studies. The title of the paper is Do Monetary Incentives Undermine Performance on Intrinsically Enjoyable Task? A Field Test. So the background tested two hypotheses, which is right. The first hypothesis is something called crowding out model. Monetary pay lowers the performance on enjoyable tasks by crowding out the agent's intrinsic interest in them. So if you pay the workers on the tasks that they like, then they are more interested only in the money, not on the task. That is what the crowding out, which is a term in economics means. Monetary pay or government interventions will make the system more inefficient. The second model is standard economic model. Incentivization of enjoyable tasks make workers more productive. And what did the investigators found? Paying people for the tasks that they intrinsically enjoy makes them perform better at the tasks. On the other hand, unexpectedly taking the payment away may make them perform worse than if they were never paid in the first place. Perhaps this has something to do with loss aversion cognitive bias in psychology. A quote from the paper, our research on output productivity and quits are more consistent with the standard economics model than with the crowding out one. Well, how about awards for top performing employers of the workplace? Does it demoralize the rest who did not get it? Maybe we have to seriously rethink these uh, decisions in light of this new finding. Our seventh story of the week is also from psychology. This is from uh, a paper published in Political Behavior by a Harvard University team. The title of the paper is Ambitious Women, Gender and Water Perceptions of Candidate Ambition. So the key question the paper tested is, are ambitious women punished in politics by the voters? So this Harvard study concluded that political parties, not the voters, hurt the ambitious women candidates. Well, this finding overturns long-held belief that the ambition is a political liability for women. That means the women should not be too much ambitious and points the blame for the glass ceiling many women candidates face towards other sources including political parties themselves. That means most of the political parties that the study analyzed are not conducive for the women candidates. That means the political parties have a glass ceiling called misogynism. Well, mind that the study is based on an online survey. And of course, online surveys have got several limitations including many cognitive biases. And this research is part of a growing number of recent studies suggesting that the women's underrepresentation in democratic parliaments worldwide is not caused by the water discrimination. The main problem here is the political parties. They are not fielding uh, the women candidates. Our eighth story of the week is also from psychology, a paper published in Social Psychological and Personality Science by a US Iran team. Uh, the title of the paper is Religious Overclaiming and Support for Religious Aggression. And the study included 969 cohorts. And the principal conclusion of the study is that supporters of religious violence are more likely to claim they are familiar with a religious concept that doesn't exist. But mind that there is another side of the same coin, a quote from the paper. Further, although overclaiming is toxic, actual religious knowledge or admitting that you did not know has the reverse effect such that it correlates with a peaceful disposition. In this way, 
Knowing true versus false stories in one's holy book is associated with peaceful attitudes, whereas claiming familiarity with false stories from one's holy book is associated with violent attitudes. Yet another quote from the paper, although many caught holy books, few have read it. Thus, religious books are often incorrectly cited or cited in a way that serves personal prejudices or distorted worldviews, uh, you know, convenient interpretation. And yes, this is toxic and this is the reason for most of the religious violence. Our ninth story of the week is again from the psychology. Uh, this is a paper published in Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin by a US team. The title of the paper is that Social Class Predicts Emotion Perception and Perspective Taking Performance in Others and the study included 881 cohorts. The main conclusion of the study is that higher class individuals are worse at reading emotions and assuming the perspectives of others. Higher class individuals perform more poorly than their lower class counterparts on reading the mind in the eyes test so they cannot understand the emotions of other people. The findings are in line with a large body of work documenting a tendency for lower class people to be more socially attuned to others. A quote from the paper, we theorize that social class can influence social information processing that is the processing of information about other people at such a basic level because social classes can be conceptualized as a form of culture. Our 10th story of the week is a paper published in PNAS. The title of the paper is Hurricane Effects Neotropical Lizard Span Geographic and Phylogenetic Scales. The paper is by an international team. The main conclusion of the study is that lizards hit by hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017 passed on their large, strong gripping toe pads to the next generation of the lizards. So that is extreme climate events can act as agents of the natural selection and it's a striking case of rapid evolution. So even the effect of evolution can be felt in just next generation. So catastrophic events like hurricanes in biology is known as bottleneck situation where a large majority of the population dies away. Only a very few individuals of the population remains. And usually during the bottleneck situations, genetic drift, that is the evolutionary process, that is very, very strong, not the selection. So the paper argues that selection works during the bottleneck events. But I was surprised to see that not a single mention of the word genetic drift in the entire article. A quote from the paper, our study suggests that hurricanes can have long-term and large-scale evolutionary impacts that transcend biogeographic and phylogenetic scales. A very interesting study indeed. Coming to the science news from the last week, first is COVID-19 treatment and vaccine update. No updates in the treatment scenario. We have three candidates of phase 3 clinical trials, that is Remdesivir, Gimsilumab and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. We also have one candidate at phase 2 clinical trial, that is Midistam. Coming to the vaccine, again no updates from the last week. We have three candidates at the phase 3 clinical trials. These are University of Oxford and AstraZeneca, Moderna Therapeutics and BioNTech Pfizer. The Chadox vaccine of University of Oxford and AstraZeneca came in news last week that they have to stop the phase 3 clinical trials because of unprecedented situation. The Oxford vaccine trial on hold because of the potential safety issue. What has actually happened is something called serious adverse event or SAE. These are quite common during the vaccine trials. In this particular case, the, a patient in the UK suffered spinal cord injury. But mind that the serious adverse events can also be related or unrelated, expected or unexpected. For example, you could enroll in a clinical trial and get hit by a bus and die. That would be an unexpected and unrelated SAE but would need to be reported regardless. This honest reporting is what makes these vaccine as well as drug trials uh, ethical as well as highly reliable. As you know, COVID-19 situation in UK is going really worse now. If you can inspect this graph, this mark point is when the UK reopened. Even the UK's pubs were reopened for the customers way back in June 29th. And now you can see that after reopening, the tremendous impact is that the cases have started rising up. And here in India, situation remains same. The graph is going up and up. 
even though we are now in unlock for situation hopefully the graph start declining sooner well according to my analysis the reason for this graph here in india is that people are not really following the government regulations ministry of health government of india has clearly proscribed wearing mask in the public spaces but hardly anyone wears these days on the other hand our neighboring country pakistan the things are much better and they are winning the fight against coronavirus as you can see in this graph last week minister of health has also issued a, a guideline regarding the antigen rapid test so rapid test all symptomatic covid-19 negative cases of rapid antigen test that is what the health ministry say so if uh, the test is negative in uh, you know this uh, antigen test the rapid test you have to repeat it this is because of the high false negativity in case rapid antigen test declares that you are negative chances are high that that declaration is false as for the latest guideline the flow chart goes like this first you do a rapid antigen test if it is positive definitely it's confirmed you it, you have to report it as a positive but if the rapid antigen test says that it's negative and still you are symptomatic then you have to go for rt pcr and in case it is negative and you are asymptomatic then you can wait for the symptoms to arise and then go for an rt pcr test given high false negatives uh, my recommendation is go for rt pcr straight away because even rapid antigen test is not that cheap last week i also came to know about a very interesting site called dinosaurpictures.org this is basically the map of ancient earth and nearby dinosaur fossils for example when i import the kochi kerala you can see that this is how the earth looks like 260 million years ago as you can see that uh, india was at that time part of a super continent with uh, africa as well as uh, australia and you know southern all the southern continents together including antarctica and this page says that the fossils discovered near cochin is iguanodon and brahat kayosaurus that name is indeed interesting brahat kayosaurus brahat like brahati shura temple a very useful site highly recommended i love this kind of sites that has got data visualization tools this is another site information is beautiful here snake oil supplement this is a site all these links are in the show notes well this site is all about the supplements you know how, uh, how good is the scientific evidence for the use of any of these supplements like fish oil as you can see there is a graph here it's a strong evidence is coffee for the heart disease or fish oil or omega 3 in in the case of pregnancy for preventing the preterm birth we have got very high quality evidence while many others we don't really have very good if evidence for example bitter melon for diabetes is very very common uh, here in india you know people believe that the bitter god juice is really good for diabetes but we have zero scientific evidence for substantiating it or black tea for the cancer prevention or sam e for the depression you know or omega 6 for the cancer or vitamin d for cardiovascular disease we don't have any scientific evidence in this infographics you can even see the b pollen for cancer our first story of the week is about the b toxin it is not really b pollen but b toxin is a promising for the breast cancer while b pollen is different that is basically the pollen grains that the bee have harvested from the the flowers and even there are harmful supplements which you should avoid by all means a very useful tools the link is in the show notes yet another data visualization site which i strongly suggest everybody to try is the measure of things for example if you have no idea how much is uh, one yard is just put one yard and it will give you the comparisons and real life examples check the show notes for the link coming to observances of the next week september 16th is the un world ozone day well you might know various conventions happened in 1980s like vienna convention of 1985 and subsequently montreal protocol of 1987 these indeed helped us to reduce the chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere that caused the degradation of the ozone layer but we still use a uh, hydrofluorocarbon and hydrochlorofluorocarbon that is hcfc as a refrigerant in our air conditioning systems but we do have uh, alternatives albeit these alternatives are a bit expensive so consumer choices matters friends please stay away from any air conditioner and fridge that use hfc or hcfc as refrigerant september 17 is world patient safety day by who 
Of course, patient rights and patient safety matters tremendously. Equally important is the enforcement of the safety regulations and the surveillance of its implementation. And from September 12th to 18th, we have 250th birth anniversary celebrations of the celebrated explorer Alexander von Humboldt. He was born on 14th September, the Humboldt Day, 1769, and he died on 6th May. 1859. Humboldt is an amazing explorer. He spent a lot of time in South America, friends. Well, one of my favorite quote of Humboldt is uh, his famous uh, Feltang Shaun quote. That is the worldview. The most dangerous worldview is the worldview of those who have not viewed the world. Similar idea is traveling is the best medicine for racism. By the way, you really don't have to physically go around the world to see what is the different worldviews are all about. You can travel to unknown places through books. By reading books, you can familiarize yourself with various perspectives and expand your worldview. By the way, Aisar Tirupati and NCBS Bengaluru is celebrating the Humboldt Week by a series of webinars uh, and talk series. You can check out Dyser Thirupati's site. Uh, the link is in the show notes of this video. By the way, if you would like to know more about Humboldt, I strongly suggest you this fantastic book. I read that in two years back. The Invention of Nature, The Adventures of Alexander von Humboldt, The Lost Hero of the Science by Andrea Wolf. Highly recommended. Coming to observances, first is astronomy related observances. September 14th is close approach of Moon and Venus. September 22 is Mercury at its highest in the evening. And September 22 is September equinox. That is basically autumnal equinox here in the northern hemisphere and vernal equinox in the southern hemisphere. On this day in the Antarctic South Pole, one can see the first and only sunrise of the year. And up in the Arctic North Pole, one can see the only sunset of the year. Earth is fascinating, friends. Lots of curiosity driven facts. On September 25, Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn close approach. Coming to opportunities of the next week KVPY, that is Kishore Vigyanik Protsahan Yojana 2020. 5th October is a deadline. If you are a student of class 11th, you can apply for this KVPY. Ramalinga Sami Re Entry Fellowship. 31st October is the deadline. Science Academy Summer Research Fellowship Program 2021 for the students and teachers. 30th November is a deadline. Thanks for watching this week's Curiosity. I hope you like it. If you like this show, please click thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and share it in your relevant groups. See you soon in my next video. Goodbye.